What's up, guys? This is Coach Donnie with ElevateYourself.org. Welcome to a Volleyball Coach Reacts to Haikyuu Season 1, Episode 10. If you're new to this channel, make sure that you subscribe and click on that notification bell so you never miss a Haikyuu reaction video. Also, check out the Elevate Apparel Store where you can buy yourself an Elevate mask, the Pride long sleeve like the one I'm wearing now, and many other cool shirts, hoodies, and tank tops. Many of those items are currently 20% off, so buy them while the sale lasts. I did not know that Nishinoya spent his entire suspension working on hitter coverage because he felt so disappointed in himself during his last game where Asahi got blocked a lot. I've definitely experienced that level of trauma for myself where I struggled with a particular skill in an important game and then I would be obsessed with that skill because I never wanted that to happen again. There are two ways to respond to tough moments and tough losses. You can either give up and believe you're not good enough, or you can do what Nishinoya did and obsess over improving your weaknesses. My favorite scene in Haikyuu so far is when Asahi yelled Suga and demanded the ball. It's one of those scenes that really speaks to your soul because you can feel all his sadness, frustration, feeling like he let his team down, but also his longing to play volleyball again and to be a great hitter and desire to evolve and to be better all in one yell. It reminds me when Goku turned Super Saiyan 3 trying to save the world for the 1000th time. You just feel this inner rage, the weight of the world, feeling tired of getting beat up and his incredible desire to beat his opponent. This is why I love to yell on the court, especially when I'm hitting. It just feels so good. Thank you for categorizing all the players by their year in school. There are so many characters in this anime that it's actually hard to keep track of, especially because there are no side characters. And it's crazy how each character has their own personal story and they're all intertwined together. That is such a difficult and complex story to write, but very gratifying once you pull it all together. I'm honored that I am the reason why you're staying up late. I definitely do that with my own favorite YouTubers, and even though I'll be sleepy the next day, I'll be smiling and feeling sleepy because I know I had an awesome night. As many of you know, it does take 5-8 to eight hours to make these videos. If you've been enjoying my content and would like to support Elevate Yourself, please consider joining my Patreon linked below, where you receive access to exclusive content like my private blog, monthly podcast, live Q&A sessions, behind the scenes footage, and more. Also, majority of the membership fees goes towards improving the quality of my videos, like this new mic stand and webcam. Now let's get this party started. Man, I love those spinning ball animations and that sweat coming off the brow. The pancake, I gotta talk about how to do the pancake in this episode. Is it called an Asa or Asahi? Yes, the best scene! Set me again. Triple block. Man, I think he broke through that block. That that ball compression animation never gets old. It's a beautiful sound when you make perfect contact with the ball. <laughs> Such a humble guy. Yeah, that's what a go-to player looks like. 
But they can't be go-to without the right mindset. <laughs> a little, little A6 advertisement. Looks like a pancake is coming. What a beautiful slow motion. There he refers to the word connectedness again. I'm going to talk about the pancake technique finally. The goal of a pancake is not actually to control the ball. The goal is just to slide your hand under the ball to keep the ball off the floor and let the ball bounce off your hand because as long as it bounces off a rigid surface it will go pretty high. The biggest mistake I see when players try to pancake is they do it from a standing position so they end up diving into the ground which not only is dangerous but it also shortens the extension of your arm. So before you pancake make sure you lower your hips as low to the ground as possible so you can dive parallel to the ground not only is it safer, but it will allow you to, not only is it safer, it also extends your reach because you're elongating your body horizontally versus into the ground. Make sure you check out that volleyball tutorial video on how to pancake in the description box. <laughs> now he's still criticizing him. He's, he's punishing him for, for leaving. But that's a good teammate, right? Never settle. Even Tanaka is calm and smiling. He's rarely ever calm. Yeah, if you have a libero that can cover you, you never have to worry about getting blocked and you can just go be aggressive every single time. Yeah, and you just have to accept that. But even if you save 20% of them or 30% of them, that's 20 to 30% more opportunities you get to, to score another point. Too fast for them to react to. That's right, this is Nishinoya and Asahi's first time seeing their special connection. That's crazy hard to do, by the way. Ukai <laughs> is frustrated because he didn't understand what the heck happened in front of him. Ah, he really just went anywhere and then Kageyama found him. One thing I'll add to that is this does seem pretty magical and, and this is rare to have a setter and hitter connection this precise especially when Hinata is not even trying to do anything except just go and he's completely depending on Kageyama to time it for him and to put it in the precise location this reminds me of the Iranian national team setter Saeed Marouf so I would say the two setters that remind me the most of this crazy connection between Kageyama and Hinata is Bruno from Brazil but I would say even more so is Maruf because he doesn't just do this to his middle hitters like Bruno. He does this with all his hitters. It really feels like Maruf plays with eyes in the back of his head. The ability to keep his hitters in maximum rhythm no matter where they are in the court is mind-blowing. And although it does seem magical, the setters are actually using all other cues other than just their eyes. 
what's really going on with these high level setters is they have a visual library that they're drawing from and they know exactly which hitter is hitting from where, what speed they approach at, and they keep track of the preferences of all their hitters without even having to ask them. The second sense is using their ears. This is one of the most overlooked aspects for setter training. You can actually hear your hitters approaching to the ball and based on the sound of the footsteps, you can gauge how far they are, where they are in the court, and also how quickly they're approaching. And it helps a lot when the hitters actually call for the ball. Not only does it communicate that you're ready, but just knowing where the sound is coming from helps the setter pinpoint where to set to, especially when the setter is back setting because they can't use their eyes. So if you want to take your setting skills to the next level, you have to develop skills that don't involve your eyes. Keep track of your hitter preferences and also and understand how their body moves in terms of their hitting approach and listen to their approach and when they call for the ball. And you might be able to set like Kageyama. Yeah, Hanada's too crazy. <laughs> Freaks. <laughs> A genius, but someone that's put in a lot of work into his skill. Ooh, over the top. Parallel toss. That means probably flat. Yeah, he's Asahi's got some natural skill, even though he took some time off. And they have some chemistry because Suga and Asahi are upperclassmen. So I want to comment on what Coach Ukai just said when he identified the differences between the two setters. He said Kageyama has amazing talent, which probably means he is super athletic and set a very fast and accurate tempo and has some decent size. And Suga is the consistent, more dependable one where he might not make the flashiest sets, but his setting is very consistent and hittable. And then he finished off with this wily grin. And that is every coach's dream is to have two setters or two players in the same position that have different strengths. You don't want to have two of the same exact players because when one of them is struggling, the other one is just going to bring the same skill set. And sometimes against different teams, you just need a different style. So although Kageyama is more talented than Suga, some teams will just do better against a faster offense. Also, it's very difficult to set that quick and that accurately all the time. And sometimes you need a setter that can just put up a consistent hittable ball and let your hitters figure it out instead of depending on your setter to try to help your team to score points. Fluid. Ah, Ukai's excited. <laughs> Tanaka's been taking a beating. He got shook in front of the bakery and now he got slapped really hard in the back. What a good guy. Yeah, I, I think I said earlier in the season that Hinata is rare to see him as a middle blocker. Usually as reserve for the taller players. <laughs> Hinata's just a, a naive young kid. I love him. I love how they hide his face, like that's what elevates him to legendary status. Yeah, Hinata wants to become the next little giant. It's always good to have a goal and a role model of who you want to be like. Parallel toss it. Oh, commit block. <laughs> 
I remember when I was younger and I was invited to play with a team that had some former collegiate athletes. And this is when I just graduated from high school. And even though we got crushed, it felt like a privilege to be able to receive their jump serves and to even get a hand on their ball because I knew how good they were and I was in such awe. I definitely relate to Hinata's experience. And I was always the, the person that would get excited to play against teams that were even way better than me. I don't know if you've ever had this experience playing on a team, but when you're playing in a tournament and you look at the schedule and then you see this amazing team on the schedule that has a great reputation for being the best team in the area, you often hear two types of responses. Now, unfortunately, majority of the kids that I've coached and the majority of the people that I've played with, they get nervous and discouraged already when they see a, a really good team that you have to play. They'll say like, oh no, we got to play these guys. Then we can't make it to the finals and so on. For me, whether we win or lose, I love playing against teams that are supposed to be great. Even if I played against the U.S. national team, which would totally crush me and I wouldn't be able to hang with them, it's a privilege for me to even play against people at that level. And I know that experience will make me better by playing against people that are way better than me. So if you're that person that tends to get discouraged when you see a better team, change that mindset and view it as a privilege and an opportunity for you to get better. And talk to yourself and say things like, they have to beat me, not I have to play against this great team. <laughs> I love Kageyama, always instructing him and scolding his little brother. <laughs> Maybe he had a moment where he really could be the next ace. Here's another animation trick, or really an illustration trick. You notice that every time they talk about the little giant and even his teammates, they're blocking out their eyes or they're hiding the face. That helps you make it feel more like a dream or a fantasy. And if you even think about your own dreams, the people you might dream about might not actually look like those people, but they feel like them. So this is one way to help convince the viewer that it's a dream, because although the details are fuzzy, they're using other cues like the movements, the body language, and the storytelling to hint that it's a dream, to make you feel like you're really in that dream or the flashback. Yeah. Unimpressed. Kageyama is unimpressed. <laughs> or maybe still processing that experiences in his own way. Lefto! <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> it was too busy daydreaming on the court. <laughs> Terasuki goes with his side comments. Uh -huh. Don't get used to it. Yeah. It might happen a lot, but don't get used to it. Uh oh. Akuma is flaming in the back. <laughs> like, what the hell are you doing, little boy? Very perceptive of Kageyama. He read him like a book. Yeah, 
Mm. Man, Kageyama's so perceptive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes tall people just don't get it. They think, why can't you do this? It's easy for me. Yeah, what a good supervisor. Tanaka staying late so they can finish their game. Oh, that is the coolest thumbs up I've ever seen. I gotta watch that again. Oh, it's like when the samurai take out the sword with the glare. <laughs> wow, and maybe Kageyama knows that, hey, if this kid wants to be the ace, he's got to start acting like it. I'm going to give him the ball and put all the pressure on him to get him used to that, that pressure situation. <laughs> Yeah, this is Kageyama's trash talk. But still respectful at the end of the day because it's Japanese. I love it. I love that confidence. He probably knows that the two of the biggest blockers, Asahi and the blonde hair guy, is going to give him an even better opportunity to work against a huge block. Or unless Kageyama's trying to show him that, hey, look, you can't be the ace, so stop fantasizing about it. I'm assuming that's Asahi's first first name. Come on, just go for it, Hinata. Who cares if they know you're coming? Oh, what else can you do? You're trying to trick them. <laughs> That was so cool. Like a ninja running in the fields. Yeah, you gotta beat him with speed if you don't have the raw power. Oh! Great contact. Ball compression on the hand. Woo! You gotta clap for that one. He told him who he was gonna set and they still couldn't stop him as long as Kageyama is there. Maybe Hinata doesn't want that role. Maybe he wants to be the ace, and this is not the role that he wants to play right now. But Kageyama is just trying to speak the truth here. Oh. He wants to be the ace. Yes. 
I get it. I get it. If you want to play something, you just gotta play it. I totally get it. They're complete opposites, but they get along like they've known each other for a while. Wonder why I said how cruel, like they were separated for so long until recently. Ooh. That's exactly what a joke floor does, it wobbles. <laughs> Yep. Doesn't look like it's traveling that fast, but it, it's unpredictable in its trajectory. <laughs> in order to serve an effective jump float, you have to make sure your hand is really flat and flexed. If your hand is too soft, then it's going to spin on the ball because it takes the shape of the ball. Let me grab my ball so I can show you. So when you're jump serving or spiking, you want to have your hand really relaxed because you want it to take the whole shape of the ball so you can transfer all your power and you can actually control it that way better. And it helps you hook the ball down or snap the ball to give it a little bit more of a downward trajectory. But when you're jump floating, you need to have a firm, flat hand so you have minimal contact on the ball. And that's really what's going to cause it to float and have no spin. So minimal contact means no spin. So minimal contact on the ball means no spin. Maximum contact on the ball means lots of control and lots of spin. I also have a tutorial video that I'll link for you in the description box on how to jump float. That's one serve that can be just as effective as a very powerful jump serve which is why you see it even at the international level. Yep, passing the most important skill. No spin. Oh, but Daichi can do it. Triple block, what are you going to do? <laughs> the shark comes. Oh, Nishinoya. <laughs> With a smile. So powerful that he pushes through the block. He's like, how the heck did this trip even get there? <laughs> That's the most frustrating experience when you get dug when no blocker is up. Uh-oh, can he not handle the pressure when the people are counting on him? <laughs> I love, I like this old team. <laughs> High schoolers are awesome, that's funny. Oh, I'm glad the old guys won. It's always good to lose early in your, your volleyball career. Oh, this means that Coach Ukai is, is coming back to coach them. Look at Tanaka's smile. Yeah, for a team that doesn't have a lot of tall players, you, you live and die by your ball control. Oh, 
Yeah, the stress of, of choosing a starting lineup, that's it's not easy, especially when you have so many talented players to work with. Wow, that's a realization for Hinata, even though he, after he said he didn't want to be a decoy. <laughs> He's also kind of awkward and nervous right now. Maybe he was telling Hinata that if the team even wants to watch you, which is the decoy, that is the even better position when they fear you that much. The crew is coming back. It's like the assembling of the Power Rangers. Here are my immediate reactions to episode 10. It's crazy how an entire 20 minute episode can be dedicated to just 5 or 6 points of a volleyball game. So that's some really creative writing when you can extrapolate that much insight into just a few points. And going back to what I said in the previous episode, when you're playing sports and you're really in the moment, time slows down and it does feel like infinity because your awareness is heightened and you're so engrossed in what's going on. So it's really great that the writer of Haikyuu can bring all of us into that special world of athletic competition. I think it was great that Kageyama put Hinata in a position that was very difficult for him and put him on the spot. Even though Kageyama can be a little bit rough in how he communicates, you can trust that he's always saying things that are very truthful and is just trying to get his team in the best position possible. But I like that he has that relationship with Hinata where he can push him to his limit because he knows how talented Hinata is but sometimes Hinata is just thinking about random things and it's just like a typical young hyper kid. And if Hinata does not stay focused, he's not going to be the amazing player that everyone knows he can be. So I think Kageyama is just trying to keep him on track. And that reminds me of one drill that I like to do with my high school teams to figure out who can be the ace on the team. I call this drill the position battles where we have two outside hitters, for example, go against each other and each one is always hitting against a well-formed three-man block or sometimes a four-man block if I really want to push them. And we just keep setting them back and forth and we just see which outside hitter scores the most points, but most importantly, how they respond to getting blocked and solving that problem of having a huge block in front of them every single time. And those that never give up and continue to be aggressive and find different ways to get around the block have that ace mentality. And those that need a perfect set and can only hit against one block cannot carry that workload. And it has nothing to do with the physical talent because I've had very tall and athletic players that can't handle a double or triple block. And I've had short players that no matter what they put in front of them, no matter how bad the set is or how many blockers are in front of them, they find ways to score. One thing I really like about the things that Coach Ukai says is he does talk like a true coach. So whoever wrote the script for his lines definitely understands the insight of a volleyball coach. 
So I'm really excited to see where he takes his team and if he decides to make any position changes. Because I know Hinata is playing middle right now. Will he move him in another position? Will he move Asahi around? Because right now the team has just been self-organizing. So it'll be cool to see how he decides to maximize the team's personnel. I like how the adult team was the one that introduced the jump float serve. But it makes sense that the adult team would use it because as you get older, you learn that there are multiple ways to score points and to contribute to a team. And it's not always about being powerful or flashy all the time. And even when a jump float doesn't score an ace, it will often cause a passer to pass poorly, which means very far off the net, which makes the setter have to run off the net and put up an inconsistent set and forces the opponent into a very predictable offense. So even if the jump float never scores an ace, it's a good tool to have because you will force the team to pass poorly over time. I hope you guys enjoyed this reaction video. Don't forget about our next giveaway where the first 150 members to join our Patreon will enter a chance to win a free Elevate Lightweight hoodie and lanyard. Thanks for watching. We'll see you guys in the next video.